in case of uh, China and Vietnam, and Vietnam uh, I didn't want to talk about one but very important uh, component of this transition in agriculture. It was discussed in the previous panel, but just would like to mention another critically important element of this transition connected with the global the integration of China and Vietnam economies on the global value chains. Uh, through these policies, uh, they can tackle and resolve a lot of problems connected with uh, trade, and uh, it was a driver of exports, competitiveness, and international, the driver of exports and competitiveness and international market. But such kind of transformation has been impossible without limited state interference in business and households activities. And uh, th these policies started, we know perfectly well, with this experiment, uh, with this formation of uh, special economic zones. Uh, it was already mentioned many times, the uh, ex experiment of a free zone of Port Mario in Cuba. In this context, I just would like to stress that uh, the experience of China and many other countries show that to ensure the zones remain economically sustainable and deliver positive externalities, an implementation of broader policies is necessary, such as elimination of ring fence restrictions and support of wider reforms and economic growth strategies. Uh, in this case, the free zone port of Mario in Cuba could become a center of development only after further dramatic cuts and bureaucratic procedures inside this zone and more consistent reform policies in the island country. And just a couple of words about uh, FSUs, uh, <clears throat> because it's still uh, rather popular point of reference, though negative, because there are hybrid regimes which established in majority of FSU countries uh, with unfinished and in many cases unsuccessful transformations. Uh, and uh, these regimes include common patterns of high monopolized markets that deter structural economic reforms, formal polyarchies with strong authoritarian trends, under reform institutions, concentration of wealth and power in the hands of oligarchs, and high level of corruptions, and significant portion of population with lost identities and a strong nostalgia for the benefits of state socialism. Cuba can escape such maladies only by creating an environment of change that breaks the holes of vested interests and moves steadily in implementing market reforms, economic liberalization, and institutional reforms. And uh, in a worst case scenario, failed or broken transition, Cuba, Cuba could also drift uh, what has become the mediocre Caribbean model, with weak institutions, widespread corruption, high level of monopolization, with prosperous but isolated clusters of tourism in the middle of poor general economic performance, environmental degradation, and rising inequality. Cuba's present hard earned advantage of having developed human capital would be squandered. Without inclusive growth, social gains would be maintained. Let me stop here, and I would be glad to continue this discussion uh, during Q&A session. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> Our next speaker is Larry Kata Baker. He is very famous here en nuestras reuniones, mucho tiempo, Te ha sido profesor, o es profesor todavía, en Pennsylvania State. Y ha publicado uh, bastantes artículos sobre China, Cuba, y... Está bien. Este es el programa de ser buen policía y mal policía. No hay ningún buen policía aquí. Todos somos malos policías. Pero ya. Yeah. 
No, 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 tenemos que... Uh, no. Uh, Como siempre, uh, as always, the economists are behind the technical. That's me. <laughs> <laughs> technical innovations. Actually, my talk is really about the inside of Gary's machine. We're going to go through and see what we can find here. <laughs> and I'll substitute that for the absolutely crazy talk that, that is still... Here. Just a minute. Oh, okay. All right. while, while he's doing that, let me just, to, to keep this going, I, the, mine is, is, is sort of the, the crazy talk of the panel. Uh, and for those of you who don't like crazy, you can think about your questions for the, the first panelist. Um, there's nothing more dangerous than to have a, a lawyer speak the language of economics. And there's nothing more dangerous than to watch the conversion of legal and constitutional systems be transformed into systems of economic modeling and algorithms. Um, and yet, I'm going to stand here and tell you, and there's nothing even worse, there's something even worse than that, and that is when Western markets trained people are attempting to delve into the very peculiar language, vocabulary, and values of Marxist-Leninist elites uh, in the context of central planning. What is going to be interesting and what I'm going to be arguing, assuming we can get this up, otherwise I'm just going to do it any way I can. Um, what I'm going to be arguing is a couple of things. The first is that you cannot, one of the funniest things about Cuba, and we've, well, I've seen this for the any number of years that we've done this, uh, there's a ritual to discussing Cuba, especially outside of Cuba, although the ritual uh, acquires the same kind of thing in Cuba itself. And that is, we speak from the basis of the way in which we understand words and values and relationships between the state law and economics in ways that are absolutely inimically impossible to comprehend from the Cuban side and vice versa. And so we'll be using very similar words, but we will not be able to understand. And that functions not just at the level of ideology, because frankly, who cares? But much more importantly, at the time in which Western entrepreneurs or Western states and Cuban state-owned enterprises and Cuban government officials sit across the table and attempt to negotiate those kind of transactions that you mean to move forward. The West and Western uh, people will inevitably tend to argue the way you argue in New York or in Kuala Lumpur. The Cubans are hearing this in a completely different way and they are valuing factors and, and assessing valuation in ways that are completely different. Putting aside the fact that this ultimately doesn't even work, because even assuming that you have a fairly sophisticated understanding of both the Western and Cuban understandings of valuations, you still have the problems of the inability of either side to actually remain true to their ideological base. So what I'm going to do is look at that, and I'm going to, and, and so from ideology, I go to, and I guess I am going to do this for 12 minutes. You probably minutes are, yes. Yeah. The, uh... Go ahead, you're doing very well. <laughs> I just want to know how you broke my computer. That's I all. haven't touched it. But in any case, by the way, I had a bunch of really pretty pictures, both the PowerPoint, which expressed all of this, and the, and the paper is online and available. So I'm, I'm feeling really, it, it was going to be crazy, now it's going to be even worse. Uh, the bottom line, and let me, let me I'll start at, at um, I'm trying to work through and, and articulate the PowerPoint slides, which is much easier because then you can drift into them and just hear me babble. Now all you have is me babble. Um, start from the, con all right, assuming, assuming that what I'm saying is, is, has any kind of validity that when you're looking at the issue of Cuba and you're looking at the issue of the way Cubans understand politics, economics, and their social program from a Marxist-Leninist perspective. The question is, well, how do you get, there are two questions. One, how do you get to what it is they're thinking when they speak? And then two, what is the fundamental character of the managerialism that tends to substitute itself for what we in the West look at systems of laws, administrative regulation, uh, and markets? And what I suggest, and, and I start, if you look at Cuba's 
um, Economic Plan and the uh, Revolución de la Nación 2030, what you begin to see is both a model of governance, which is substantially different from what we have traditionally understood as governance. And in fact, we move from a system of laws and regulations to a system of algorithms that's, and managerialism grounded in administrative discretion that substitutes for laws and regulations. And within that, we can begin to see what is valued in the context of decision making by the Cuban states. So I started with this extraordinarily dense document. Have any of you read the, uh, the, um, the Economic Plan 2030? I don't even think the Cubans read it, right? You probably got through the first page and a half and you say, I would rather slip my throat than read it. I read through the, and rightly so. But understand what's going on. The thing is deliberately written that way. The same with the conceptualization de, de Sistema Socialista Cubano. They are written deliberately this way in order to make it impossible for normal people to actually understand what's going on. You have to sit and invest the time. Well, what is it that they're creating with the conceptualization? You create the normative basis in which the Cuban government was very clear in saying that, look, we don't understand law, politics, economics, and social experimentation the way you do. We view this as a whole, and indeed when we value and we assess what we're going to do as a state agency, as a police agency, and as an economic agency, these are the conceptual basis in which we reject markets, except to the extent we have to deal with them, and we view economics, social, and politics as inherently interrelated. We go from this conceptualization to the economic model, um, the, the Plan 2030, and what you wind up seeing there is the application of this model, this notion that the state has prim uh, uh, primary place, that economics is meant both to mold individuals and to produce the sort of value that the vanguard party can use to move Cuba wherever it is they think they're moving it. Uh, and to do it in a very systematic way. The Plan 2030 looks like gibberish, but if you look at it very carefully, what I argue, uh, and I, I don't have very much time, but I'll, I'll just express it. What you're looking at it is a series, it's not a multivariate series, but a series of hierarchically arranged algorithmic equations, relational equations, through which the Cuban elite, not you and me, but those who ultimately get to decide, which are the people who whisper into the ears of the state council members, uh, the, the people who deal with the Mariel Special District and the like, how they both approach macroeconomic decision making in Cuba, but also specific decisions on what is to be invested and the terms in which both foreign investment money comes in and the operations are actually implemented on the ground. You start with the core vision, the 2030 vision, which is a sustainable, I'm going to see if I get this right, a nationalist, sustainable territorially, uh, whose territory is, the integrity of the territory is preserved along the socialist route that creates a sustainable and moderately prosperous society. That's the ultimate goal of every, not just a macro policy, but a micro policy as well. The Unilever transaction, the transaction with the Brazilians, all meant to do that. Well, what does that mean? In the uh, Plan 2030, you start with the, uh, I have to do this from, from my own head, let's see if I can do this. You start with a, how much time do I have? One minute. One minute, all right. <laughs> Normative themes, which is paragraph 39 of the plan, if you're going to look at it, look at paragraph 29. Normative themes, there are nine of them, including defense strategy, military um, preparedness, um, and social progress. Beyond quote unquote Western style economic notions, you start with a, a, the normative theme plus the 23 guiding principles. If you do not have either, if you do not have a positive value, and I go through a series of complicated equations where you see this normative themes, uh, core normative themes, guiding principles, and then you have strategic themes. There are six strategic themes, each of which has a series of major objectives and minor objectives. And these are then attached to the 11 um, sectors of the economy which are targeted. 
what winds up happening is you put all of this together and I have like half a minute. What you wind up seeing is you actually have a systematic way of working through in a very, very straightforward way an analysis to determine whether or to what extent an individual transaction is worth it, the, uh, the character of that transaction in terms of its terms, what goes in it, what will be rejected, the way it fits into everything else, and whether you're going to go forward or not. And all of this is very algorithmically set up. The focus of this, then, is to move power from the legislature and from, and actually from um, Communist Party theorists down to the level of administrators who use, who, so it, it's not clear whether they use it or not, there are a lot of problems, the, the paper is very long, um, but if they did, what it does is create a, a, a system of administering and managing administrative discretion both at the macro level and at the micro level of each decision, right? to guide the administrators so that you no longer look at the legal economic system in Cuba as laws and economic policy, but you view it as a series of algorithms which are um, which produce a set of guidance for the exercise of administrative discretion, ultimately in the state council and then in the provincial um, people who actually do some of these things. And that is what winds up being the legal structure, the, the rule of law and economics within Cuba. Forget law, forget administrative regulations. It's all managerialism grounded in this extraordinarily opaque authority in discretion, but grounded in these algorithmic formulas. The reason this is important, this is not just a weirdness from Cuba. Cuba has been doing a lot of work with the Chinese, and what most people have not yet seen coming, and it is coming, is what the Chinese are calling their experiment in social credit, which is to move from a regime, a Western-style regime, which they have, and they've been very clear about this for the last 15 years, um, except no one in the West listens because we only listen to what we like to hear, that we move from a regime of rules of law to regimes of managerialism grounded in the same sort of management techniques that Apple and Amazon use both in the allocation of their internal resources because they're not market players within their global production chains and then in the way in which they manage their customers, stakeholders, and other. And that's, in a sense, what you see Cuba as a very flawed way of approaching this, but this really falls within a much larger um, set of what is coming, and that is the social credit managerial system for moving and developing productive forces in the West through private enterprises in Marxist-Leninist states, uh, much more successfully eventually in China under social credit, and then in Cuba through this. It's probably not going to work in Cuba because they don't have the discipline, and they certainly aren't doing this in their heads. Right, it's, it's, not, it's, it's not conscious, but it is likely you are going to see this in a much more fully developed um, way in China and Vietnam. Sorry about the PowerPoint. Um, you can look at them online, and thank you. Larry, thank you very much. My suggestion is forget about PowerPoint. The presentation was there. <laughs> uh, our next speaker is uh, Luis Locari. He's professor of uh, economics and business in the School of Business Administration in the city of Miami. He has been uh, coming to ask her for uh, how many years now? I was a founding member. A founding member, that's right. <laughs> so, Luis, please. Uh, how much time do I have? You have. Uh, I'm going to discuss it, so. You are discussing? Yes. Uh, 10 minutes. 10 minutes, okay. I'll have a stopwatch here. <laughs> Dark. Okay, um, <clears throat> the, uh, the time limitations are going to make me allow uh, me to only uh, touch briefly. Um, I'll say, though, to, the, the only thing worse than the things that you said was to actually have me as the discussant of this paper. Um, I think the, uh, the big difference is not between economists and the way Cubans think. I think the difference is the way Western lawyers and Western economists think. Um, <laughs> Anyway, I'm going to start first by discussing a little bit of uh, Vadim uh, Grisham's paper. <clears throat> um, social scientists sort of have these two, two hats or two roles that we oftentimes find ourselves wearing. And uh, one is the, the, the researcher, the, uh, 
the evaluator of policies and so forth, sort of the positive side of, of, of whatever field we're in. And the other one is sort of a, of advisor, uh, whether it's formal or informal. And I've always noticed this very much in, in ASCII where people sometimes are doing sort of pure research kind of work and other times they're giving advice to, to how Cuba should do various things. Um, and of course the research can, 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 can inform the advice, but, uh, uh, but they are really distinct functions. The, the paper by Vadim has both elements into it, but I think the, the second part, the advice part, is, is, is sort of the, the, the dominant one here. And the case of Cuba, though, have always, always struck me as the fall, something like the following. Imagine an alcoholic, and think of a, of a therapist. Maybe the, the therapist has done research in, in addiction, is a specialist on this, and has ideas of how the alcoholic can recover, can, 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 can change their lives for the better. The problem all hinges, though, whether the alcoholic really wants to quit or not. If the alcoholic doesn't want to quit, no matter how good your advice is, it's going to be useless. And I think the problem in the case of Cuba is that Cuba doesn't want to recover. They're, they're the alcoholic who's not really interested in seriously doing something like this. Um, and so, you know, I can go, I can go back and, and, and answer and, and say something else about the Cuban situation, why I think it's, it's different than some of the other ones. But right now, I think the only question that really remains is, uh, can, the, uh, can the current system survive the old guard dying out? And if it can, if it can manage to do that, then I don't see that any, any transition really is ever going to uh, uh, take place in any sub substantive way. Um, on the paper by, uh, by uh, Larry, I, um, uh, you know, the, the, main, the, the point that I'm going to address is this one about the algorithm algorithmic nature of the, uh, of the, uh, of the plan, the, of, the, of the National Economic and Social Development Plan 2030. Um, since the other issues are more philosophical and would take too much time to discuss. Um, the, uh, at first glance, it's, it's certainly not obvious that, that, uh, that this can be turned into some sort of actionable algorithm, either for implementation or as a guide to implementation or how to do things or how to evaluate performance. Um, the, as he's pointed out, these objectives are presented in this hierarchical fashion where as you move down the hierarchy, uh, things get more specific. But the specificity that he points out seems to me to be somewhat of an illusion. It's sort of as if a, a company came up with a saying, our main objective is to improve, uh, is to have a, a high quality product. Well, that's pretty, pretty vague. So the second stage is to say, well, quality has a dimension of color, shape, uh, uh, blah, blah, blah. Well, again, it's more specific in some sense, but not particularly useful. And the next one says, well, by color, for example, we mean intensity, um, how vibrant it is, how attractive the color is. <laughs> and, you, and it sort of becomes this endless sort of vacuous statement, as far as I can tell. In fact, just reading the, uh, the, the parts of the, thing that he, of, the, of the report that I guess he translates or at least reports to us in, in English, I think I lost five IQ points. I can only imagine what happened to Larry uh, from reading the whole thing. Only five. Yeah, well, I only read you know, the short statements that you had there. Um, now, the, the, you know, to expect an algorithm to come out of this, I thought was a bit of a stretch. Um, but he kept on promising that the algorithm would come, so you know, that got me to keep on reading. Um, and, but I was expecting some sort of Sort of, you know, algorithm only with quotations and mark. I was expecting something fairly general. And it turns out that all of a sudden you turn a page and wacko, math equations come out there. Okay? Now that really surprised me. I wasn't expecting something, you know, that, that formal. Um, but there, here's the basic, two basic problems I think that, that arise with this. Um, one is what he, what he basically has is he has, like, say, an overall goal, and that goal is a weighted average of some sub goals or, 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 or ends and, and or, or objectives, whatever you want to call them. And these in turn are, are weighted averages of other individuals, of other ones and so forth. And so you have this, that's how you built this hierarchy. The problem is, as he readily acknowledges is, the weights are not in the plan. But I would argue, and therefore there's discretion, but I would argue that that's kind of the definition of an algorithm. There's no implementation here to say that, you know, uh, the you know, product quality is a function of color and 
it's a weighted average of color and shape, even if you know what color and shape mean, what are the weights? And to say that it comes out from discretion doesn't help you very much. In fact, he seems to say that at least the plan tells you what are the important uh, aims of, 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 the, of, of the government. But even that's a statement about weights. Presumably, there's maybe an infinite number of potential goals. It's just that the ones that make it into the report are the ones that have some sort of threshold, minimum threshold of, of weights attached to them. And if one of these ends has a, a weight of one and the other one has a weight of 100, then that makes a very big difference in the whole thing. So without knowing these weights, without having an idea of what the weights are, I don't see how you get an algorithm. But it sort of gets worse because the actual things that are being weighted are themselves vague, and, and I don't see any way of measuring them. So let me take one of the things that's most specific. For example, the, the, the government identifies certain sectors that, um, that are, 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 are important and have to be focused on. So one, one, what he does in his algorithm, he says, well, we can think of a, any, say, a project and see how it affects each one, of these, each one of these sectors. And if it affects a sector positively, we'll give it a one. If it has no effect, we'll give it a zero. And if it has negative effect, we'll give it a negative one. Well, but of course, I mean, there's big ways, of, you know, a jab is really big, big difference than having a, a right hook hit, you know, hit you. So the question is, you need something about intensity here. Well, so he puts in something which amounts to a weight, which is also intensity. Where did the intensity come from? Well, we don't know. It's up to the discretion. Well, again, that's necessary for an algorithm. Um, so you, you, know, you basically don't have a one minus one zero. You know, what you have is you know, these intensities multiplied by these parameters. So again, we don't, we don't know what that is. Um, beyond that, you have the issue that there's no notion of opportunity cost or so any sort of constraint. When you do A, you give up doing B. And therefore, it isn't simply a matter of saying how the goals are met. Somehow you have to have some sense of opportunity cost. Um, and without these things, there is no algorithm here. There's, no, there's not even a framework for an algorithm as far as I can tell. And so I, you know, to paraphrase uh, Andre the Giant in The Princess Bride, I don't think algorithm means what you think it means. <laughs> okay, that's what I would, you know, we would differ a little bit there. Um, maybe a lot. Um, he, you know, he, he actually describes this stuff as a hodgepodge, but not a senseless one. I agree. I'm sure that it tells you something about something, but it doesn't give you, as far as I can tell, a, uh, a coherent uh, basis for, for a, 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 any sort of real algorithm. Um, he, in fact, at the end, uh, uh, applies it to, uh, to the pharmaceutical industry. And my, here's my argument. If I had not read the first part of the paper, I would have interpreted everything he says about the pharmaceutical industry identically to the way I interpreted after I read the first part describing the, 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 the national plan. I don't see how in any way it informs me. Everything that he says about, about pharmaceuticals makes perfectly good sense and would have made perfectly good sense to me as something that Cuba would want to do and how it would be doing it and so forth uh, in, the, in the absence of, of, that, of that plan. Um, so I'm still actually under, under, under uh, under my 10 minutes. And Thank again, you. I had a lot of more other comments, but limitations, so, you know, Thank prevent you me from doing it. Okay. Yeah, I apologize. I have to, a family issue has come up, and I have to leave a little bit earlier. So, sorry. Harry? Gary now has been a for a very extended career in the State Department before the becoming a consultant. He's been one of the founders of also of ASCII. And he's now the coordinator of the Ebola advocacy group, correct? Well I was. We sort of let us with Ebola sort of disappeared, at least temporarily. Okay. So anyway, I apologize for my computer. Um, it decided to, uh, it wanted to um, update itself at the inappropriate moment. Um, luckily, I only had two PowerPoint slides, so I don't have to, unlike Larry, not much is gonna be missed. 
Um, my paper is up here, by the way, if anybody wants it afterwards. I've got a lot of copies, and I'll probably put some more papers out. Okay. I don't have much time, and then my paper's too long, so let me quickly hurry. The topic of my paper was influencing Havana. Is it possible? For years, the American political system has debated Cuban policy. For over 50 of those years, we had an active policy that demanded change in the island. It was characterized by the embargo and diplomatic isolation. Then under President Obama, we tried a new passive approach. We reestablished diplomatic relations, allowed unlimited remittances, and picked away at the embargo. Lip service was paid to economic and political reform, but nothing was done to press the issues. Neither policy has worked. The question is why? And my main focus here is on the barriers to change. The most commonly mentioned barrier to change in Cuba is simply that those in power do not wish to relinquish it. One variation of this theme is that Ro Castro wants to eventually pass power to his ex-son-in-law, Luis Alberto Rodriguez Lopez Cajejas. That's pretty good, getting all those numbers names out. <laughs> um, or to his, uh, am I missing a page here? I'm missing a page. Just a second. Out of order. Nope. Okay, anyway. Or, the, or to his, his, um, his son, who's in the state security forces. Um, let me get that extra page, because it's still in the office. I'm sorry. Yes, thank you. In this scenario, in this scenario, the current designated successor, First Vice President Miguel Diaz Canal, will simply be a transition figure. It is probably safe to say, even if the family, family dynasty version is discounted, most Cuban observers and most Cubans believe that the goal of Raul and his men and the men around him is to keep their movement and party, al and party alive and in power. Either version requires the continuance of the state and the prevention of concentration of power by others, including in the economy. Any policy reform that would challenge these requirements is likely to be rejected, although the fear of economic collapse and a general uprising must be considered by those in power. All the above mentioned parties share with the public another fear. How will they fare in a competitive economy? Under the current system, they have reasonable job security, do not have to work very hard, and perform at elevated, or perform at elevated levels of competence. And of course, they enjoy a modicum of a social safety net. For three generations, they have been taught that the safety net would not exist in a capitalist system. The failure of the Cuban economic system, the exposure of Cubans to the to their diaspora, and general globalization of information has given many Cubans a different view of their system compared to the possible alternatives. Nevertheless, conversations with many middle-aged and older Cubans will often raise fear about their ability to adapt. Winding its way through all these concerns is the thorny vine of ideology. Presumably a critical concern to some, and much less concern to others, Ideology provides legitimacy to the existing order. It is not just Marxism. The thoughts and pronouncements of Fidel are very important, and many of those initial decisions made in the aftermath of the revolution have become its very justifications. Now, Larry, in a presentation he gave last year, um, argued that there were fundamental differences between these Chinese Marxist theory and Cuban Marxism. Referring to the developments of the Second Party Congress, and like Larry, I actually read all those documents six times before I understood them, more or less. He says that chapter two takes up the issue of ownership of the means of production. Here comes one of the central elements of Cuban theory, state ownership. 
The dominant position of state ownership, when combined with state control, forms the core basis of the theoretical conception of the Cubist, of Cuban socialist modernization, who perfectionamiento is the object of this exercise. This stands in marked contrast to the Chinese general program, whose central object is state management for the purpose of moving Chinese society closer to its ultimate objective, the establishment of a society so rich it can produce a communist and social economic order. Later in the footnote, well, later Kata also addresses the difference in attitude on the problem of wealth creation. This is reflected in the respective approaches to wealth creation, wealth differentiation. For the Asian Marxist, mar Asian Marxist market, market Marxism, the rise of income and wealth differentiation must be tolerated as the nation develops its productive forces. For the Cuban central planning Marxism, the state must use the law to avoid the development of wealth differences. Determination that private enterprises may be, may be limited to the extent that they amass too much wealth in a central assess element of this approach. However, Cotter's view of the importance of ideology is not universally shared. Arturo Lopez Levy argues that the more significant difference between the Chinese and communist models has been the power of the nomenclatura and the lower levels of bureaucrats in the party, the government and in all the state enterprises, all of whom benefit or believe they benefit from the current system. He argues that Chen Xiaoping's reforms in the late 70s came after the Chinese bureaucracy had been decimated or at least cowed by Mao's cultural revolution. Cuban bureaucracy has encountered no such disruption or purge. As I have mentioned several times in his past years, Raul's desire to democratize the party may ironically make change more difficult, since it would make change subject to the consent of those most likely to oppose it. Skip a little bit here. Well, no. Finally, even if a critical mass of actors at all levels are ready to make major reforms, the question becomes how to proceed. As we've discussed in many, already in several panels, the Cuban authorities have recognized that economic efficiency requires the elimination of the dual currency system and a policy of market prices. Yet these goals, to achieve these goals, they would have to allow the bankruptcy of many state organizations and the loss of employment and opportunities for corruption for the lucky and politically connected. Other needed policies, such as the growth of the private sector entrepreneurship in the public and private sector, and accumulation of wealth are all neither not understood or, view in, <coughs> or viewed as a challenge to the system. And of course, changing the, the exchange rate also creates a problem for the, the, the ideology. Well, with the collapse of the Soviet Union in the um, 1990s and the retirement of Fidel in 2006, there was renewed hope that the Castro regime would collapse. It fumbled, suffered from a severe fall in a country's standard of living, and made some important economic changes. But the regime survived, retracted some of its reforms, and continued with the assistance from Venezuela. And then coming into office in 2008, President Obama decided to try a different approach. His basic argument was that, after all, these 50 years have shown that isolation has not worked. It's time for a new approach. I believe we can do more, than su more to support the Cuban people and promote our values through engagement. I do not believe we can keep things doing this thing the same way over five decades and expect a different result. I do not expect the changes I am announcing today to bring about a transformation of Cuban society overnight. But I am convinced that through a policy of engagement, we can more effectively stand up for our values and help the Cuban regime, people help themselves as they move into the 21st century. 
President Obama also believed that his loosening of restrictions on financial transfers would help the private sector with opening the trade and investment. So much as the law allowed, and maybe a bit more, would help the American economy. So how did, how much time? I'm even, not even half finished yet. Yeah. I thought I had 20. Well, I know you have plenty. <laughs> okay. Well, basically, Obama's policy hasn't worked. There's been improvement in state-to-state -state relations. Uh, some of the things, important things have been accomplished. Um, and for the most part, they justify the reestablishment of diplomatic relations. But there has been relatively little progress on political reform. In fact, I would argue quite the contrary. And um, some long-term political prisoners were released, but since then political repression has intensified with a significant increase in the number of short-term detentions. Ben Rhodes, the Obama's White House National Security Advisor, recently published a blog entitled Charting a New Course with Cuba, Two Years of Progress. Rhodes, of course, was defending Obama's policies towards Cuba. Space prevents me from doing a full analysis, as does time, but one egregious assertion de deserves comment. Rhodes claims that the new policies, including unlimited remittances, has allowed for the growth of the private sector. And proudly reports there are now 500,000 licensed independent businesses, a dramatic increase from eight years ago. I would suggest the historical record does not support that claim and might even be having the opposite effect. The first progress in restoring the private sector in Cuba came not from removal of sanctions or more foreign inflows of capital, but because of the collapse of the Soviet Union in the early 1990s, which restricted the flow of capital from abroad. Only then did the regime begin to make changes. Quinta Propistas increased from a, few, from a few tens of thousands to 210 in January 96, before falling to 147 in 1997. There they stood until 2010. As the Venezuelan money came in, the pressure was put on, the, on small enterprises and, in fact, they retracted somewhat. In 2008, with, world, with the world economic downturn, capital formation in Cuba had declined, and with Fidel re retired, Raul was ready to try some new reforms. And so we've already discussed and many times here the reforms of 2008, 2009, we, he, he did allow an increase in family remittances. Then in October 2010, in the following year, with the six-party Congress, there were significant poly changes in Cuba. The government announced it would cut government employment by 1.5 million. The number of occupations available to Cuenta Por Pistas rose from 21 to 178, and later to 201. Cuenta Por Pistas were also allowed to employ non-family members. And by 2012, the number of Cuenta Por Pistas had risen to 405,000 and 483,000 by 2014. This all came before the change in diplomatic relations. Remittances helped, but they didn't make the policy change. The most striking response, and I'm getting finished, to the Cuba, was the Cuban response to the U.S. decision to reestablish formal relations came the following April with the Seventh Party Congress which allowed some additional market mechanisms and clarified, the and clarified, however, that private property was really a variation of usufruit ownership. The guidelines established by the Congress include, and this is important, the ownership and management of certain fundamental means of production by non-state enterprises. By non-state natural legal persons, is subject to temporar temporality, it's temporary, and other conditions stipulated by law. In the forms of non-state management, the concentration of property shall not be allowed, 
and it added, not of wealth. Explaining this, Raoul made the comment that, depending on a predominance of one form of ownership over another, a country's social system is determined. I think that is a very clear statement of where they would eventually like to go. I'm not going to discuss Trump's proposals, but get to the final point, can we influence Havana? Cuba is in a Thucydian stasis. A back and forth movements between the forces of reform and the status quo, though there's a lot of observable movement, there are very, there are very little, but very little ever changes. And when change does occur, it comes slowly. Given the internal tension around the equilibrium, outside influences, and I am finishing, outside influences should be able to shift the balance, but the Cuban system is antibodies that resist such influences, especially those specifically directed to influence change. Okay, bottom line, and I'm skipping quite a few pages here, the bottom line It's not clear that anything will work. I have in this paper, I talk about constructive engagement, which is something I proposed back in 2011, and I still think is the best approach, but I'm not sure that would work. To repeat, Cuba is in a Thucydian stasis. It can barely respond to offers of foreign investment from other countries. Although it's a clearly stated policy of, has a clearly stated policy of wanting that investment. It still has not resolved the issues brought forth in the six-party conference of 2011. It is not even clear that a Cuba with an updated, mostly market economy would accept political reform. Ultimately, I am coming to the conclusion that a political revolution, hopefully peaceful, must become before economic reform can take place. The best we can do is offer Cuban authorities a choice such as constructive engagement and then sit back until the Cuban government or the Cuban people decide to make a change. In the meantime, we should start arguing with each other. Thank you very much. And that was butchered, but anyway. <laughs> Our next speaker is Juan Tomas Sanchez. I can give you a long bibliography about him, but all I can tell you is when you want to know something about the Cuban sugar industry, past, present, or future, call Tomas. Well, while he prepares that, I hope you are an optimist and you're going to enjoy my presentation. And if you're a pessimist, I hope I bring a little smile into your face. Basically, the presentation is that Cuba is sandwiched in an impossible transition between two mutually exclusive systems. It's a, it's a long paragraph, but, you know, we are in an impossible transition between two mutually exclusive systems. What I will bring to you is a few things from the air. The, the opportunity cost. How much is this costing? And basically, what I work, my argument is in labor, and labor in the, in the sugar industry, because I foresee that when that impossible transition occurs, Cuba will be for several years in a very old sugar production mode until uh, the new economy uh, takes over. And when you study, like I pretend to show, where is next page? No, I love it here. When you look at the 1950s economy of the sugar industry, I hope you're surprised as I was when I discovered that 53% of the sugar income is wages and salaries. I don't know of any other industry that could have such a high percentage. You know, the 1950s harvest 
were worth in altogether $600 million, and they were $300 million in wages. I'll show you the documents from the Banco Nacional so you uh, believe what I'm saying. Basically, what that means is if today Cuba were again a normal integrated sugar exporter in the world market, and Cuba could be exporting between four and five billion dollars a year in eight, 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 nine, ten million sugar tons per year, the labor component of that is mind boggling. I think if we are talking about two, three billion dollars in wages in, in Cuba, uh, that is actually a lot more one than what the five million people that are earning wages uh, now. Uh, you can see there, I've been preparing throughout the years a few uh, presentations on, on sugar, but the one that I enjoy the most was ripping apart the Crichton University report on the resolution of the Cuban claims. That was an absolute disaster what the, uh, what's the, name? the Crichton University uh, proposed. Uh, so basically, the title of my presentation is that, a soft, swift transition. How do you make a soft, swift transition? It's going to be very difficult, but it has to be soft because it should not be as Venezuela's. It should be bloodless. But as everybody in ASCII, I think, agrees, it has to be swift. You cannot delay a transition between two uh, impossible uh, uh, government systems. And basically, you know, in the last few years, there have been a lot of things written about Cuba, but very little written about how do you get back on a path to, to growth and prosperity. And the last sentence there says, getting back on track doesn't have to be enormously painful. So if you are an optimist, please remember that. And. Uh, one thing that, that, that we should remember is that this Cuba today didn't just, was just not born out of itself. You know, we have a 500 year tradition and it took us 200 years to end slavery. And you, when you were a young kid learning history in Cuba, one of the worst things that the Spanish colony did to us was a hundred year of the Estanco del Tabaco. That, yeah, you know, that will make you really hate the, the Spanish colonial government. I, hope, I think they don't teach that today. They have to be very polite in what they say about Spain. Uh, but after, uh, after the Borbones took uh, the crown in Spain, there were fairly modern uh, government uh, ideas in that era, and then after the taking of Havana by the British, the whole thing in the, of the economy in Cuba became a lot freer, and we became probably the richest colony in the world, is what I hear many times say. I don't know how is that documented. In, 90, in 1894, the year before our War of Independence, we were already producing one million sugar tons Amazing, you know, without tractors, without uh, electricity, we were producing a million sugar tons. But this up and down that we always have recovered from is a, a few years after the war, 60% uh, of that was lost. But then in 1920, the harvest was worth uh, $1 billion. Imagine in 1920s, $1 billion of a sugar harvest. But a few years later, in 1933, it was only worth $80 million. So after 1933, we, become a, we, be, we started a recovery period that ended up in whatever we were in the 1950s. Thanks in many ways because Cuba inherited the rule of law from Spain, which was very strict in, in the business sense, but gave us a framework of rule of law in which Cuba never lacked, even during the Spanish colony or in the Republic, 
Cuba never lacked foreign investment because we had a very strict and very quick way of awarding, let me say, use the word justice in, 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 in civil law. Uh, by, by all this time, by this 200 years, Cuba was always the most efficient sugar producer uh, in the world. Today's Cuba's sugar industry is beyond analysis. A country that is only recovering three tons of sugar per hectare, where with before all the last 60 years progress in, in sugar cane production, in the 1950s, we were extracting double that, six. Today, the world average is seven. And there are many countries like Guatemala and Brazil and some um, Australia that are extracting 10 to 12 tons per hectare. And Cuba is down at three. So, you know, there's not a lot of analysis I could make about the sugar industry there. Uh, in the area of the opportunity cost is wages. And here, you know, I have an example that uh, in the sec uh, first bullet point, in, in the 1950s, the minimum salary, today the minimum salary is 10 Cuban pesos per day, 250 per month, equivalent to 10 per month, and, and I think this morning, uh, I think somebody used the figure of 180. But anyway, on the GDP per day, the minimum salary is 1% of the GDP per capita. If you go back to the 1950s and you do that same math, you find out that then it was 314% was the relationship between the minimum wage, which was around $65 per month, and to a per capita of around $248. So that will give you an idea what is the opportunity cost that is being lost year after year after year when there is no path between that and uh, what we have, and much less what Larry was uh, forecasting a while ago. But this is the uh, same thing from Salazar Carrillo's most recent book. Uh, Cuba in 1956 was fifth in the world in, in GDP paid in compensation. He says we were fifth in the world with a 64% uh, uh, GDP uh, of GDP paid in, com in, in compensation. Lately, Cuba claims the 13th place in the world, but that is, I'm sure, using the one to one dollar to Cuban peso conversion because there's no way that they could be there uh, today. And, and that's some of the uh, numbers there, exact numbers between a sugar crop and wages in, ag in agriculture and wag wages in, in the industry, in industry. Uh, and this is from somewhere, you know, the Cuban wage today is five US cents per hour. So I think we have a long way uh, to go, but not in this system. The sugar business highlights, let me give you two or three because uh, it's not really understood. The most recent 10 years, the price of sugar, the average of the most recent 10 years is 38% higher than the earliest 10 years. The world market of sugar has grown in the last 17 year, an average of 3.8% per annum. So it's a very healthy system. Cuba can incorporate itself whenever the, the, mar the economy of Cuba and democracy in Cuba is, is ready. It's a, it's, a, it's a market that continues to grow and we're there, we will be efficient. We have, I don't know, we have more ports to export sugar than, than, than Brazil. The Panama Canal is closer 
to us than it is, I think, probably to most of, of, of Brazil. So Cuba can, again, be, be competitive. And, uh, OK, uh, let me see. All right, let me see if there is anything. These are quotes. The first one, it's, it's a little bit hard, but I think I'm going to take a second to read it. To extend the institutional looting could look nicer, but only for those that are held by it. For those that continue paying for the fun of others, that is impiously perverted. To think to leave it all as it has, no cost at all, or softly change it is for fools, but for cynics too. And the other one is by La, Larissa Diversent. Uh, I thought that maybe she would be here, but she's today in the, in the conference. And the other one I just hinted around is that Levi Marrero, probably one of our most proficient uh, uh, historical economists, is saying that, that Cuba abandoned the Middle Ages at the beginning of the 18th century. And uh, a soft transition, uh, the only way I envision it is through the people that today are trying to gain space in La Asamblea del Poder Popular. It's going to be very hard, but I'm looking long term and I'm looking with a lot of optimism. I think that's the only route to have Cuba in a, in a soft transition without any bloodshed and swift because I think that by then they would have learned uh, what basically what ASCII can uh, teach, uh, let's say in a, cap in a hypothetical seminar in the capital of, of Havana. And SWIFT, because there is a lot of assets in Cuba that could disappear the same way that they disappear in the Soviet Union in the transition. Uh, so whoever is in the National Assembly at that time is going to have to be very smart to see how you prevent the looting of the, you know, if we have 66,000 hotel rooms in Cuba, how many of those belong to the states? And if you put an average price of $50,000, $100,000, we're talking many, many, many millions of dollars in assets that belong to the Cuban people that could be exposed to, to looting. And uh, going back, I have a paragraph there. We have to remember that in the 1933 revolution, when Machado left Cuba, and the students and labor, whatever, took over the government. All it took is a one page in La Gazeta Oficial to make Ramon Grau the president. And Ramon Grau, during the first 100 days of his government, is something very nice happened in which he tried to take care of most of the social issues that Cuba had. Among them, he stole, stopped evictions, he stopped foreclosures, he lowered the cost of electricity and uh, many other things that eventually, with time, became a constitutional law in Cuba. And, uh, and how is the GDP going to grow? Well, GDP comes from basically from these four, four, four accounts. I don't think there is much hope that with the system that Cuba has now, that there's going to be a substantial growth in GDP in the foreseeable uh, future. Uh, well, this I've already mentioned it. And uh, about wages in the sugar industry, uh, let me take a moment to try to explain how the worker share in the gross, production, uh, gross income of sugar. Official salaries began, and this is for field work. In a second, I'll talk to you about industrial work. It was set at 50 pounds per day. That's a minimum wage. Even if you're someone taking care of the time that the workers work, your minimum salary starts at 50 pounds per day. Then Batista, in 1952, wanted to be in the good side of, of the workers and gave him, gave him a 10%. 
but before that it was adjusted so workers would get paid 48 hours for 40 hours worked that had added a 9.9%. Then a month vacation and the national holidays accounted for another 9%. So that became 28% that added on this 50 pounds. The minimum wage, if we are going to start tomorrow with that same right of the workers, and I'm sure the labor unions are going to be the first and most for formidable friends of the Cuban sugar industry, that will be 64 pounds per day. If it's today 15 cents a pound uh, in the low range, that will be nine, ten dollars a day. Uh, the projections based on, on Brazilian statistics is that the, the Cuban sugar business will bring one million jobs between direct, indirect, and induced. Induced are those created by the indirect uh, work. And, uh, let's see, an investment. To rebuild the sugar industry of Cuba, you need approximately $20 billion that if it's invested wisely, it should take eight to 10 years to be uh, invested. And uh, basically, I say in sugar mills to update, to update, no, to build new sugar mills with three purposes, ethanol, or generation of electricity, and sugar is about uh, $13 billion. In land preparation, it's about $1.2 billion. And on top of that, you add equipment, locomotives, trucks, tractors, rail, run, rail lines, roads, and ports, most of them without any government uh, cost because the sugar mills own the rail lines and the port, most of the ports are paid at least at the ports. So uh, we're not talking about uh, needing a lot of government grants to get the industry back in, in time. One minute. Dos. Dos. Thank you. And uh, I, I wanted to display this because this is where the source of this labor uh, and wages information comes from. This is the Anuaria Azucarero de Cuba. Uh, this is the statistics. Uh, many people have not seen a statistics by the Banco Nacional of the Cuban Gross Domestic Product as detailed as this. You will be surprised that they deduct remesas from the GDP and uh, some of the few uh, details there that are very interesting. Uh, the sugar paid a lot of taxes. One example that I thought I had in one of the slides, there was half a cent tax on each 325 sugar pound bag. Well, but how much is that? Well, in 70 million bags in a 5 million ton crop, that's $170,000 a year that was split between La Biblioteca Nacional y La Estación Experimental del Azúcar. The money that went to the Biblioteca Nacional was like guaranteeing the survival of the Biblioteca Nacional with the sugar, with the sugar taxes. There were many, many, many taxes in sugar. The institutional rebuilding of Cuba it's one of the things that uh, will start pretty soon. And, and you see there, they are the, the, the colonos, the hacendado, the, way, the laborers, and a lot of and many other institutions that had a direct role in the policy of the, of the government uh, for the running of the sugar industry. And, uh, I don't remember where I get the statistics, so I'm not going to dwell on it. And this is the law that set the salaries for the workers in the sugar mill. You'll see that there are hundreds of categories there that had a salary established per day or per month based on certain price of sugar and how to adjust it to the, to the price of sugar. And, oh, okay, well. 
the last one, you know, there was a lot of things. So I hope I raised your expectations about the future of Cuba and that you live very happy today. And if you were a pessimist, please see me. I'll buy you a drink at the ASCII thing. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Our next speaker, Sergio Diaz Briquet, is the senior vice president at Casals and Associates. Yeah, all I can say is he has written about, I don't know how many books on Cuba, the whole of them. And, no, and mucho. Particularly, <laughs> no como, Car no como Carmel. <laughs> yeah, particularly the connection between economic and social development. Yes. Well, thank you very much. Uh, let me, to be quick, it's really hard to follow Juan Tomas because he's an expert on the sugar industry. And all, about all I know about sugar is that I put it in my coffee. So <laughs> having said that, uh, you know, I think he, he explained very well his, his views on the past and future prospects of the sugar industry, focusing on questions, historical issues related to labor and opportunity costs. Uh, and he makes what I think is an unexceptional uh, argument that Cuba could become one motor for growth in Cuba. That's clear and no one would disagree with that. Uh, at the same time, uh, I think he acknowledges, and it's obvious as well, that it would require some major uh, structural transformation for obvious reasons. And he also mentioned, I don't think this was in the paper, you threw a number, $20 billion in investment. In the, wow, that's a big number. I mean, I was looking at some other uh, uh, document that uh, some very gross estimate that, for example, one of the major crises in Cuba today is the housing sector. And they're talking that to really attack the housing sector, we're talking about anywhere from five, four to six billion dollars, or, you know, over the long term. So we're talking about a lot of money here. Uh, you know, and then what seems to me that is clear that whereas Cuba has a, a great deal of potential, uh, it would have to, to, to capture a growing share of the existing sugar market. And to me, the problems here, while the, the prospects, it seems to me, they are uh, significant, there's things that we need to consider. And I, again, I, 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 I'm not 100% uh, of this, but certainly I know at one, which is that we are facing already a growing, uh, a slowdown in global population growth. And that's one. Uh, the indications to me, at least looking at the U.S. market, is that there's a growing uh, a slowdown, lower per capita consumption that may or may not be reflected in other developing co in the developing world, but certainly in the in the in the developed world. Uh, increased competition. There's many other countries that have moved in into the sugar uh, uh, production business, and the sugar sugar substitutes. Uh, so you know what play do we have in there, we don't understand. At least I don't fully appreciate. I think it's very clear in the fact that the derivatives uh, are a potentially major uh, avenue for growth, and we've been talking about this ever since I was a kid, and I'm 74 years old, so this has been going on for quite a while. But I think the question remains that is there. Uh, to, the other big question in my mind is that uh, land is a uh, finite uh, resource, and you talk about opportunity costs, but I wonder in the current global market, what are the opportunity costs for shifting away from sugar, if we were to have the, all the sugar, into more uh, value-added crops? You know, the uh, classical example being uh, you know, some of the countries that export to the United States and so forth. The old argument that uh, we would be better off, at least in this country, if we were to shift production uh, of certain things. The classical example, tomato, to other places that we can bring here uh, more economical and so forth. Uh, and the other question that comes to mind as well, and uh, you know, I see, uh, the, the, the cost of recovering those lands in Cuba that have been damaged. And obviously this is an investment, but we understand at least, <laughs> sorry, I, and I understand it, that there has been a, a terrible environmental uh, 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 damage to Cuban lands that could be recovered, 
and maybe you are factoring in, and in fact, I believe you mentioned 1.2 billion dollars that that may be required. But I think this is a, a very nice paper, and I enjoy it. I'm moving on to uh, Gary now. Wow. Uh, the first thing I said is, what am I doing here? Because it's not a, a I thought, Gary, I don't think your paper was about, about economic issues. It was about, about political issues. Um, you know, and, and the first thing I, when I was reading your paper, which is very nice by the way, and I'll make some comments about it, that economic logic has never been a dominant in Havana. I mean, from day one, I mean, so to assume that at this point in time they're going to come up and, and, th and think uh, things, uh, economics. So it's really about politics. Uh, and he co 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 correctly concludes that neither carrots nor sticks have ch helped change the policy position of, of the Cuban government, whether to liberalize politically or ideological. I do like a point that uh, Gary made in an, on an aside that he didn't mention in the paper, which is his assessment of the Cuban embargo. And contrary to our understanding, he claims it, it has been a resounding success. And I tend to, to, to agree with his view. It may not have worked in Cuba, but Kerry's conclusion and all State Department hand is that he has sent a very clear message to other potential Cubas, at least on a historical basis, that uh, you know doing certain things would uh, bring a cost. So in that sense, I think that uh, you know the, the historical record remains to be seen. But I think it's a, it's a very interesting point. Um, I think his points he made it very clear, I fully agree, about the claims that made by Ben Rhodes and the assumed success of the Obama policy, at least in the sense of promoting the, the small business sector growth, is, is, is false, it's not true. Uh, what I think is missing in, in the analysis, as I see it, I mean, again, I'm not a political scientist either, so I don't know about you, but I don't know about political science, but it seems to me that what the paper really lacks, in my view, is that we are not taking into account. He mentioned ideology, but I would call it a little, a, a, a bit different. I would call it a national political culture. And a national political culture, being 74 years old, I was 14 when the revolution triumphed, or 15 or whatever the case, around that time. And I remember, Two things, uh, the enormous ignorance about uh, economic issues. You know, if you recall, all the promises by Che, by Fidel, we're gonna produce more milk than Holland in two years, we're gonna do more cars than anything else, in part because the arguments were that uh, there were two things constraining Cuban economic development, Cuban growth. Imperialism, the joke of the American uh, state, on the Cuban nation and the capitalist exploitation of the workers. I think I put that, that in the context because if I recall, Carlos pro remembers probably very well as well that the first two or three years of the revolution were prosperous. There was a lot of these investments, the, the, the expropriations of property, uh, Pareto came into place, the circulation of the elites, it created an ambience in which people, there was a lot of social mobility. You know, the people left Cuba, people who had never dreamed that there would be a manager of a property in Cuba became, so there was a demonstration effect that created in the leadership a, a, a world vision that what they have been saying all along, the exploitation by the gringos, the exploitation by the capitalists, if we take control of the country, we would create this new world. And that really shaped in, a, in an environment of ignorance. I, 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 I guess maybe Carlos remembers this, but I remember a reader when I was in grad school, was a, a bit older, a comment that was made by a guy, I can't remember, it was a famous economic development reader that said that, uh, that Korea could not develop. And the reason, because it was a Confucian culture. Well, we know what happened in Korea. So I think, I'm trying to think about the, 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 the cultural context that developed the thinking of all that generation that Raul, by the way, is no genius. His education, I don't think he went very far. So, and all those people the same way. So, 
Yeah. I think that, that the, 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 there were a, a series of general misconceptions that really led uh, to understanding, not understanding what economic growth was and developing a series of ideas about uh, what those things are. So, and in my view, what happens in Cuba is that ha that thing has persisted. This guy still believes this. Raul still is in the back of his mind says, oh, but gee, I mean, were it not for the embargo, maybe we could have done all these things. So, my, my point is, to your point, why we have not the, the carrots or the sticks, because these guys don't think in those terms. They think in a different way. So the, the solution for the transition in Cuba is going to happen. And it's what we all have been talking for a long, long time. The, el relevo generacional, the demographic, demographic solution. Fidel is already gone. Uh, I was mentioning to some of our colleagues here that if you read grandma on a daily basis, I'm, I'm amazed every third, fourth day there's a story. Comandante Pepito X, pass away, hero of the Moncada. Every day, they keep dying. I mean, we all keep dying too. <laughs> so it was to get there first. <laughs> so so, so my, my, my point is, you know, again, that regardless of the policies of, of Bush, Obama or Trump, the alternative is the, the, the generational recycling. The question is, is how fast? Uh, and I think that what is accelerating the process, which it, it really is, is very clear to me, is the, the traveling, you know, the visits both ways. I mean, 15 years ago, there, were, there was no one here from Cuba. So there's a lot of exposure back and forth, the multiple visas, multiple entries, and the internet. So I think that there's a question that once Raul and the other, the other few ones are gone, the change is going to happen. That's the same as well. Thank you very much. There's actually very good management schools. And the problem is that, uh, that managers cannot manage. And uh, why? Because there are just too many constraints. That's why, um, as uh, Everlane said this morning, the uh, subsidies, the, the deficit will be uh, huge this year because state enterprises, for instance, um, uh, need to be subsidized. Simply, managers cannot make anything efficient. So, but yeah, I think this has filtered through, and they, I think you probably have a point that uh, they're trying to incorporate it, uh, their concept of efficiency. But, you know, the, the the question is, uh, a lot of discretionality remains, even when they do uh, an algorithm. Maybe they could. I, I think that uh, Luis Locai's comments were interesting, but but even when they have, if they could have algorithms, uh, then they still have a lot of discretion, and that's, you know, essentially adding to uh, the difficulty for managing and risk. Armando. Well, Tomas, just a quick question. Uh, uh, the, wages, the wages that you mentioned in the Cuban uh, sugar industry were mostly seasonal during the harvest. What happens? What well, happened afterwards? Well, the, the statistic that I quote is, is the year end. Unfortunately, you know, there is summer, winter, spring, and, and you know, and when there is a lot of rain, you cannot harvest or work, you know, it's a seasonal like like Cuba, you know. If you grow vegetables for export, it's gonna be in the winter, sugar is in the winter. It's very hard to survive as a laborer in in the summer months. Hopefully maybe tourism in the future would help. But the, the wages I quote, they say three hundred million in nineteen fifty eight uh, is from the Banco Nacional and, and it's a whole year uh, wages, but uh, I don't have a, a breakdown. I've seen it, a breakdown of what is harvest season and what is dead season in agricultural wages, but I, I don't have it with us. Uh, in support of Gary's thesis, obviously, are the North Koreans who have resisted far more than Cuban forces have been exposed to. Secondly, of course, is the case of Honduras, when five years ago, the President Mel decided to uh, be reelected 
unconstitutionally and was removed after the Supremes uh, and the Army intervened. And Honduras was then subjected to UN uh, castigos, uh, OAS suspension, American aid drops, EU aid drops, and essentially the Honduran successfully gave the finger to the world and lived happily ever after. I suspect one of the problems is globalization, where no matter what governments do to a certain extent, it is ameliorated by the free flow of private market forces and all many other things, substituting Canadian or Argentine wheat for American wheat, etc., is obvious. So that the pressure one presumes the OECD countries have is very, very minimal. Thank you, Paul. I have one, one question, Thomas. Uh, you mentioned about derivatives. Do we have any idea of what is the percent uh, of uh, the value of derivative in relation to the, uh, to the sugar industry in any other countries? Like Brazil, something like that? Well, there is, there is only three things that are of value in, in sugarcane. You know, the bagasse to make electricity. And then from the juice, you could make ethanol and sugar. Those are the big boys, ethanol and sugar. And for instance, the United States exports ethanol to Brazil. So what, that's one of the options uh, if the sugar market no, what, the, the thing is that we have leverage. Cuba will have leverage on what to, like Brazil does today, how much to do ethanol and how much to do sugar. So it's a new basket of goods for the sugar cane that was not there uh, 60 years ago. But the other things are, are very small, you know, the cardboard and acetone for the fingernails, you know, those are things very little. The big boys are uh, electricity, ethanol, and, and sugar. Well, it's a big business for the rum makers, but for the sugar mills, you're basically selling some kind of a waste. Uh, I have just a, a question regarding the, the new places where I'm producing sugar, like you say, Australia, Brazil, mechanization of the industry or the cultivation and the industry in those places. How is this achieved and how will it be achieved in Cuba? I, th I think it's going to, you know, if it goes as planned, you know, that like Cuba in uh, five, six, seven, eight years become, uh, let's say, an eight million sugar ton harvest. Uh, is going to take a transition because it's very expensive, the harvesters, it's very expensive to modify the fields for the mechanical harvest. Each mechanical harvester costs half a million dollars and, the, and eliminates a hundred workers. So one of the things that you have to think is, well, can I lease it from, you know, a country that doesn't have a sugar harvest at the time of Cuba, so Cuba doesn't have to buy it. So you can lease it and send it back so, so you don't have to outlay all that capital because that's, that's, that's very, very important. So, uh, but basically today is, is a three-tier market that I said, electricity, uh, ethanol, and, and, and sugar. You have a comment? Uh, thank you very much. I'm, an ex I'm not an expert in, in, in sugar production, but I would like uh, just to make a very general observation. There are risks if, if Cuba comes back to sugar business. Uh, if it will not be accompanied, if Cuba can't accompany it by structural changes, uh, by uh, a business environment, then we can receive a new lentifungias, big, efficient clusters, which cannot spill out their uh, development impact on Cuban economy and Cuban development. So, <clears throat> because we are talking about transition, and transition should 
involved all aspects of Cuban life. So without these structural changes in institutions, in uh, regulations, in uh, <coughs> market mechanism, we cannot achieve what we would like to receive through a growing efficiency, attracting new technologies, and uh, uh, connecting this production with very prosperous markets like the United States. Again, it's an important piece, but it's only one puzzle. And thinking about transition, we should think about these complex issues. Without this complexity, we cannot reach a successful transition in Cuba. Cuba has a unique opportunity to come through perfect transition because it can be based on experience of other countries. We didn't have this opportunity and chances in 90s, actually, when we started the changes in the Soviet Union. Cuban have this unique opportunity. First, second, huge resources and advances, technological advances, which we can attract and use in different industries. But from my perspective, the main asset of Cuba is human resources. I saw tremendous changes in Costa Rican economy during the last quarter of century, which happened because of human capital. Human capital is the main asset of Cuba. And we should soon think how we can, what instruments we can apply to use this capacity, to open this capacity for, for this country. Thank you very much. I apologize. Larry? I just, just two seconds. I want to underline the points that you've just made, um, with which I agree wholeheartedly. And all I kept thinking of, it, it's the United States and Cuba, in a sense, right now, are, are two twins separated at birth. When I think of Cuba and sugar, I think of the United States and coal. Um, and that poses a tremendous danger. The, the overwhelming temptation to move the clock back to January 1st, 1959 and to start over, I think is a very alluring but a very dangerous way to plan Cuba going forward uh, in the way that is dangerous for the United States in its own economic planning. To the extent that sugar offers some leap in technology which has some global market potential other than uh, merely increasing the risk of diabetes in the global population, I think it may be worth doing it. But otherwise, uh, and here for once, at least the elite thinking is not off base in looking at high tech, value added, um, high value industries as opposed to the old ones. Um, whether it works, whether or not, it, it, it doesn't matter. But, but it is a caution that applies in a way um, probably with more force to the Americans right now than, it, than even to the Cubans. But it, it's something that's worth remembering among us non-decision makers. Uh, before we finish, I always wanted to make a comment. I, I hurried through my own presentation. wasn't very happy with that. But anyway, um, I really recommend everybody to read Larry's paper of last year talking about the Seventh Party Congress. I haven't read his paper this year yet, and 27 pages of ideology and algorithms is sort of frightening. Um, but his paper last year on the role of ideology was ex very, very good. It taught me something. Well, thank you. And um, I had to read it about three times. But um, it's worth going back and taking a look at it. Okay. Well, I, I wanted to say how insignificant the U.S. and Cuba relationship is going to be that day that I foresee when there is no trade in sugar between Cuba and the United States, and Cuba is trading four or five billion dollars a year between Europe and Southeast Asia and Africa. You know, the role of the U.S. Embassy in, in Cuba will be then as important as, as this paperclip compared to what it was when Cuba was a 75 or whatever percent of the exports were to the United States. So the relationship with the United States is going to be very small and very insignificant, maybe mostly in people's trade and, uh, and those things. Any more questions? I have uh, one more question, uh, to, uh, Tomas, in relation uh, what role would the domestic sugar industry 
play in whenever it, if Cuba comes back into the market, would it have a role in the U.S. market or will it be just the world market? Uh, just the world market. I, I don't see Cuba, uh, not even ethanol. We cannot sell ethanol. If we could sell electricity, maybe, but we cannot sell ethanol or sugar in the United States. And not even with Trump, there is a change in the subsidy of sugar in the United States that has a penalty of $3 billion a year on the population. Not even Trump is, cha is changing that with all his promises to do that. He's guaranteeing uh, the trade with Mexico. He's not going to do away with any changes in the, in the sugar policy of the United States, and the Americans will continue to pay an overprice of $3 billion a year the people that made confitures, you know, leaving the manufacturers of car caramelito, yes, or leaving the United States because the price here is very high. So uh, basically, that is the support that I say that the relationship between Cuba and the United States would be minimal compared to the relevance it had uh, in the previous hundred years. Okay, thank you very much. Enjoy the cocktail.